and show us live on Facebook. I think we are. Hello and good morning. Are we live? Let's see. Yes. Yes, we are. Praise God. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me see. So excited that everybody is here. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning to everybody who's just joining us. My name is Monica and I co-pastor uh, the Seeker Hill currently online community with my husband, Pastor Rob. And we want to welcome you to what we're calling our digital sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe place set apart for a particular purpose. And our purpose here is to draw you to the light in hopes that you will become a light bearer yourself. We don't believe you're watching this by accident. In fact, we prayed for you just now. So grab your coffee and your breakfast taco and make sure you have something to write with so you can note down anything that resonates with you so you can refer back to it throughout the week. We're in the second week of Advent, which is an interdenominational tradition practice in the last four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Last week's theme was hope and this week we are discussing the Fresh Prince of Peace. Some people thought we were going to talk about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So we did a little contest earlier about who could um, sing the intro to the show. And we're going to play the video of that right now. <laughs> Just kidding, Clarissa. Anyway, shout out to her. She's awesome. She did that. Anyway, it was really fun. And if you haven't uh, been receiving our invites to the Digital Sanctuary, you can register by texting the word TRIBE, T-R-I-B-E, to 832-648-1961. Um, and so you can join us and uh, we'd love to see you. We'd love to have you with us. And uh, it's just such a great time to be together the best way, with the safest way that we can. So back to the Fresh Prince of Peace. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words. For unto us a child is born, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's in Isaiah 9, verse 6. And if you follow along on the YouVersion Bible app, you can search Seeker Hill Church and look for the event and, and all the, um, the music that we sing together uh, in our digital sanctuary and uh, the scriptures are here, are there. Um, so one of the most iconic songs for Jesus' birth was Silent Night. You know the song, silent night, holy night. I'm not going to say it's too high. All is calm, all is bright around yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace. Y'all remember this song? Sleep in heavenly peace. It all sounds so lovely and perfect, but let me explain something to you. Peace was not the word for the events surrounding this, surrounding Jesus's birth. His parents were running from the law and the most powerful man in their world was exerting his power to exterminate this child who would be born king and children were being slaughtered because they might have been him. Peace was not the word. And so the words used in this song were heavenly peace. This is the kind of peace we're talking about today. When there's terror and destruction, chaos and confusion, there's also heavenly peace. Jesus slept in this heavenly peace as a child. And even as a grown man, we find him in this peace, sleeping while he's on a boat in the middle of a sea while there's a dangerous, terrible storm going on. That is heavenly peace. I recently heard the phrase, the present time, the present must be disrupted before, change, before the future can be changed. The present, the present must be disrupted before the future can be changed. So I feel like if we want peace in our lives, it doesn't mean that we're going to ignore things in our lives that we're not peaceful. Peace is not the avoidance of trouble. It's not passivity or laziness. So what is it? I was trying to think of the best way to, to define it. And one of the ways I thought um, is a good way. <laughs> it's just the way that it's expressed. 
when you have peace, there is this sigh. <sighs> the opposite of that is like Marge Simpson when she groans. I do that sometimes since I've been married, right? Anybody else with me? Uh, you know, a little bit of grinding of the teeth. <laughs> and I, I was thinking like, if we needed P Jesus to bring peace, if people were preparing for hundreds of years for the coming of Christ, how long were we without it? About how long were we as a human race without peace? And took me uh, as far back as Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they had a light. Their light was so glorious and who they were in their life was so perfect that nobody, you couldn't see a flaw on them. It doesn't even mention that they were naked until that light was gone. Have you ever met anybody like that where they could do no wrong? It just seemed like they were so perfect and so right. And you married them and found out that was all wrong. <laughs> and I'm just kidding. But, um, but seriously, I mean, sometimes, you know, you see the light and you're like, man, that's so perfect. Um, and that's how Adam and Eve were, but like literally, and then uh, they were told, you know, go multiply and bear much fruit. And then they sinned and they lost that light. And I imagine seeing them, you know, and they're this glorious creatures, beautiful, perfect, amazing, you know, and then suddenly they're, if you can imagine like pale, I mean, you don't have to imagine real hard, right? Just look at me. Uh, but they're, now they're pale and their eyes are darkened. And, uh, you know, they were told you wouldn't have to struggle in work. You wouldn't, you don't have to struggle in childbearing. Just go bear fruit I mean, multiply. And so now they're told you're gonna have to struggle. You're gonna be in darkness. And, and that's how people were for the rest of the, the lives. So enter the fresh Prince of Peace. Jesus is that light. Now he's like, be the light, you know, to the world. And, uh, and it just happens. It seems like uh, if you know the beginning of the story and you know the end of the story, uh, it just, it's really fast. We lost the light. Now we have the light, but we're in the middle of that is the peace. So talking about defining peace, um, didn't want to give you the Webster's dictionary definition, but I just want you to think about it. Could it be that peace or, um, yeah, peace is the opposite of unrest you know i mean there was the seventh day god created and he's like this is holy and then adam and you fall so then he's like y'all gonna have to sweat now childbearing is not gonna be so easy now you're in the darkness so it's like peace the opposite of peace is like unrest it's darkness it's blindness and I feel like it kind of uh, shows that that is what the opposite of peace did. Peace is because when Jesus comes, you know, he was the light and much of his activity was doing things like healing, reversing blind eyes and deaf ears. Remember when John the Baptist was like, are you the, the Messiah? And he said, tell John, people are being healed. People, blind people are seeing, deaf people are hearing, you know? And so going back to our opening scripture and Isaiah, when Isaiah says he will be the Prince of Peace, right before that, right before he says there's a coming child, he says this, this is Isaiah nine, verse two, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And then he goes on and he says, and for us, a uh, for unto us, a child is born. So what, so this was the state of the human race. Children of Adam and Eve were people walking in darkness in a dark land, waiting for a light to shine. So this goes on for thousands of years. Enter the fresh prince of peace. So to this day, we are born into darkness and must be born again into the light. In the light is where we have heavenly peace and we are still in this land of darkness and so we end up in this heavenly peace but we end up leaning back towards that darkness because we're still in this land right and we have to be brought back to the light and that is the christian way we accept let's see this is a christian
Christian way, okay? We accept that we have sin in our lives, right? I mean, anybody come to Jesus without sin in their life? Nobody, right? We all, we have to accept that. There's something wrong with me and it needs to be made right. It can be made right through Jesus. So we accept that Jesus, we accept that there was sin in our life, like Jesus did on the cross. He got on the cross and he said, put all the sin on me. And then he, we die to our sin, like Jesus did on the cross. We raise, rise from the grave like Jesus did after he died and boom we're back in heavenly peace like Jesus was we're this creature filled with light now did y'all catch that our walk as Christians when we accept the sin we die to that sin and we raise rise again <laughs> we become born again that's exactly what Jesus did he showed us the way he took on the sin, he died to it, and he rose again. That is what we are to do. And there is a really big word that is super important to all this story, the greatest F word of all time. It is a secret weapon against any and all violations done to us or done by us. And would you agree that when somebody violates us in some form or fashion, or when we violate someone else in some form or fashion, that creates a lot of pain. That takes away the peace, right? So here comes the greatest F word of all time, forgiveness. When we sin, we have forgiveness. When someone sins against us, we have forgiveness. The consequences of sin, of this violation, always needs healing, which we also have. This is heavenly peace. You, can, you can't have peace without forgiveness. Christ makes peace between us. We make peace between Christ and the people. This is 2 Corinthians 5.19. In other words... It was through the anointed one, that's Christ, that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping record of their transgressions, which are like violations and sin. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. That's what the church is here for, to make disciples who practice giving and receiving forgiveness as we follow the path of healing. So what does that look like? Briefly, a, a simple example is the process that's demonstrated in the 12 steps of recovery. In 12 steps of recovery, you admit that you're wrong and that you need God. You admit the true nature of, of your sin. You repent and you practice continual self-examination and you teach others to do the same. That is the way of peace. Romans 10, 9 says, and what is God's living message? It is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For we publicly declare with your mouth, I'm sorry, for if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will experience salvation. Believe that he is. Confess. Yeah, I did it. Or it's been done to me. I'm hurting. I need healing. Repent. Change your mind. Change your ways. Remember that disruption I was talking about? There cannot be a change in the future unless the present is disrupted. That means you're going to have to let go of some things, whether it's the sin that you're doing or the hurt that was caused by someone's sin against you. And then you go and you share that love and peace. You walk it out. And then when you sin again, you come back to the light. You admit that you did something wrong. You die to that. You rise again as this beautiful, living creature you were meant to be so does everybody know what that word ruminating means going over and over like in the dryer when we are ruminating on the collateral damage of sin whether it was done to us or something that we did there's no room for peace we have to meditate 
through relationships, scripture, song, and giving to remain in Christ, to have that light, to stay in that heavenly peace. You see, relationships remind us of God's goodness and how much we need it. Scripture ultimately points us back to Jesus. Song aligns our very soul with the spirit of God and giving, well, giving helps us to cognitively address the security we so easily revert to in this natural realm. The security that says, what I have, I deserve. And if anybody wants it, they have to earn it. They, can make, they need to make me believe that they deserve it, whether they're in so much poverty or that they do something really good for me, then I'll think about being generous. So we practice generosity in part to rebel against that short-sighted nature and acknowledge that in the grand scheme of things, having clean running hot water makes me pretty rich and fortunate in this world. And what did I do to deserve this? Generosity humbles us to admit we have what we have by the grace of God. We do not cultivate our fortune in this world. We have to come to terms with the ebb and flow of our flawed humanity. We have to find ourselves in utter depravity, laid bare at the feet of Jesus, emptying ourselves out so that God can fill us with his Holy Spirit and we can rise again from the ashes in power. That image of the phoenix, if you don't know the story of the phoenix, look it up, same thing, rising from the ashes in power. But when that happens, we find ourselves often like the parable of the wheat. Bad seeds were sown and the harvest of our character has yielded quite a bit of nasty weeds. Y'all know that story? Jesus told the story in Matthew 13, 24, um, he says that kingdoms, uh, sorry, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who plants all these good seeds in a field. And at night, when everyone's asleep, the enemy comes and plants poisonous weeds among the wheat and leaves. So when the wheat starts to grow, the farmer's um, hired hands, they're like, they see it. They see the weeds and they're like, oh my gosh, they go to him and they say, should we just tear them all out? Like, we got to get rid of them. We don't want to grow bad weeds. And, and he says... No, if you pull out the weeds now, you're going to uproot the wheat that we need, the wheat that we want, the wheat that I sowed, right? This is God saying, I sowed good wheat, you let it grow. And even if the enemy put out that bad wheat, we're going to separate it. We're going to tie them in bundles and burn it. But you have to let them grow. And so that's what happens to us. In the garden of our hearts, there's good seed that is sown. This good seed that is growing and don't think that God doesn't know that the enemy has come by in your life and sown bad poisonous seeds. And he did let them grow. You've been saved for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. All of a sudden you're faced with um, some kind of sin that you're just tripping out. And you didn't know you still dealt with this. And this was a problem. Maybe it's something new. God knew it was there but he couldn't have removed it back then. Now is the time, now that it's fully grown and scary and the roots are deep, but you gotta trust him. So what do we do? When you recognize those bad weeds, bad seeds were grown, those bad deeds, bad habits, bad thought patterns, bad mess, can we just call it sin? When you recognize that in us, you have to let that part of you die like Jesus did, sinless. He said, hey, there's sin. Put it on me. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. That's what we do. Hey, I have sin. I got to let that part of me die. It's going to rise. I'm going to rise again when that part of me dies and I'm going to be new. I was listening to a neuroscientist recently. And he was saying, every time you learn something, your brain changes. You are nothing like that little girl or that little boy in you that was hurt a long time ago who made decisions and you're saying, oh, I'm like this because this is what happened to me when I was little. That's not even you anymore. You have new information. 
You are a new person. You have been transformed. And just because you realized and discovered that there was some bad seeds, bad uh, poisonous plants that grew up inside the garden of your heart, that doesn't change anything. Jesus showed us the way. Peace is not like a gift to be taken like a watch. It's not like something you just get and you're like, yay, I have peace. I have Jesus, I have peace. It is a gift to be received and experienced like a skydiving voucher. And like skydiving, it can be a leap and it can be scary. When I accepted Jesus into my heart and I started reading the Bible and spending time in prayer and worship, nobody around me changed. Matter of fact, some things got worse. I was the only thing that changed. I was the only one. My thoughts, my emotions, my conclusions, my perspective, I had heavenly peace. And that's when I became an agent of that peace. I became a light. In John 14, 27, Jesus told the disciples, I leave the gift of peace with you, my peace, not the fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, don't be pulled into different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout the day offering your faith-filled requests before God, overflowing with gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. And then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Christ Jesus. Another translation of that scripture says, be anxious for nothing. That is God's kind of peace. That is heavenly peace. Courage inducing anxiety reducing peace. So, how about you? Do you want this kind of peace? One of the most beautiful examples of peace that always brings me peace that came to me in a time where I, my world was very unpeaceful. There was a storm in my heart and I was taken by the Holy Spirit to this passage, to this chapter in Psalms 131. Verse two and three says, I am humbled and quieted in your presence. The psalmist talking to God, like a contented child who rests in its mother's lap. I'm rest. I'm your resting child and my soul is content in you. Oh, people of God, your time has come to quietly trust, waiting on the Lord now and forever. Will you trust him today? Will you accept the fresh prince of peace in your life today? Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, our soul pants for you like a deer who is thirsty for water. We want heavenly peace. We ask you, Jesus, to come into our hearts, to be our Prince of Peace. Teach us your way of admitting, of letting die and of rising again into perfect peace. Help us to know when we don't have peace, Teach us your way, Lord. Let your word come alive to us. Holy Spirit, guide us. Today we declare Jesus is that child 
that wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We invite him into our hearts. We believe that he died, was buried and rose again and that we will rise with him. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. We ask you, Lord, that in this time of whatever our lives look like, that you teach us to abide in you and to have that heavenly peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. If you prayed that with us today, if you were live with us on Facebook or if you're watching this video, just let us know. Let us know if you were blessed today. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know if you're having trouble having that heavenly peace. For now, our Facebook friends and uh, our live people, we want to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope that someday you will uh, join us on our Zoom chat in our digital sanctuary. We love y'all. Bye-bye.